This lecture is titled, Can You Find the Twelve Disciples in the Gospel of John? I thought I would do this as the first lecture on the Pesher of Christ. I already did a lecture on the Pesher of Christ as an introduction. Now, the Pesher of Christ is a very detailed review of the Gospels that ties all of the different possibilities together, sort of as a detective novel, figuring out all of the connections that there are in the gospel and ignoring all of the so-called scholars that have come up with all sorts of fanciful answers that are mostly totally incorrect. And here we're going to use logic to connect all the dots as much as we can. And a perfect way to start is the Gospel of John, because the interesting thing about the Gospel of John is that it doesn't have a disciple list like the other three Gospels. Matthew has a disciple list, Mark has a disciple list, Luke has a disciple list, and even Acts has a disciple list. And yet John does not. And if you look through John, there are many strange individuals that are turning up and yet there are gaps in the disciple list itself. If you compare them to the other three Gospels and Acts, there are some persons that don't appear at all. Now, I'll say right here that there is one missing disciple, and that is Matthew. But all of the others can be matched up, and that's what we're going to do in this lecture. After that exercise, I will go into greater detail about who the disciples are and take them from the picture of Da Vinci's Last Supper. So first of all, the Gospel list of Matthew is a good place to start because it's the first Gospel. And here you can see in Matthew 10, 2-4, these are the names, and we'll use the Matthew order to define the disciples. So number one is Simon, who is called Peter. Everybody knows him. And Andrew, his brother, that's number two. Next, there's James, son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. That's three and four, and they usually do appear together. And then five is Philip, and six is Bartholomew. Seven is Thomas. Number eight is Matthew, the tax collector. And number nine is James, son of Alphaeus. And number ten is Lebius, whose surname was Thaddeus. And 11 is Simon the Canaanite. And 12 is Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. And of course, everyone knows that person. So you might have familiarity with some of the names. As I said, Peter is everybody knows about, but he's also called Simon Peter, which can be confusing. And then James and John are simple enough, but there's a good story about them, especially the person that's betrayed to be his father, Zebedee. Now, Philip, you know from the Gospel of Philip, which became very popular because it talked about Jesus kissing Mary Magdalene on the, and then there's a blank. So you might say it's lips, or you might just say it's forehead or something like that but it was a scandal when it was found. And that was quite recently. It was found in something like 1945. And then Thomas, you all know as the doubting Thomas, who didn't believe that Jesus had been resurrected. And then Lebius, whose surname is Thaddeus, he has so many different names that it's hard to track him down. And then Simon, is listed as the Canaanite in some of them, and in others he's the Zealot, but he doesn't seem to appear very often in the Gospels. So now if we look at the Gospel of Mark, in Mark 3, 16 to 19, they're all here in a slightly different order. So number one is Simon, who is called Peter. James, his brother John, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, 
and Judas Iscariot. Now in the Gospel of Luke, Luke 6, 14 to 16, we have Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, but then we have this Judas of James and Judas Iscariot. Now in Acts 1, 13, this is after the crucifixion and the disciples are getting together to decide what they're going to do next with Jesus having been crucified, or so it is indicated. So Acts 1 to 13 is Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and then we have Judas, son of James. And then, of course, there was a replacement for Judas, whose name is Matthias. And they chose between two people for this position. That's in Acts 1, 23, 26. And the clue to who these characters are is they're saying Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and the, the brother of Jesus is called James Justice. And clearly the concept of Bar means son of. So Barsabbas is son of Sabbath. And the tip off is in Acts 15, 22, where suddenly we get to know the names of Jesus' brothers. It says they sent Judas called Barsabbas and Silas. And it's interesting that this Judas has this same last name, Barsabbas. Then in the Clementines, which is an interesting group of stories, but of course it was banned because it reveals a lot of embarrassing things to the concept of who everybody is. And it's very, very valuable in the Pesher of Christ. And one of the interesting things that it does say is it says that Matthias is Barnabas. And this finally reveals who Matthias is. And of course, Barnabas is a corrupted son of Sabbas, Barsabbas. Of course, Jesus' brothers are shown in Matthew 13, 55. Is this not the carpenter's son? Is it not his mother, Mary? And are not his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? So all of the brothers are named here, but actually Simon is the youngest. So this whole replacement for Judas in Acts of this person called Matthias is really saying that James, the just, the younger brother of Jesus, was passed over for the next younger brother, who is Joseph Barnabas. So that shows you a little detail of how things are worked out in the Pesher of Christ. But let's get back to the simple question that was asked at the beginning. Can you find the 12 disciples in the Gospel of John? So we looked at the four lists that we have in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts. And when we compare all of these together, they all match up, except for this Judas of James. And actually, this is a very simple thing to match up because you just look at which one is not mentioned, and it turns out to be Thaddeus. So Thaddeus has to be the same as Judas of James in Luke and in Acts. And again, this concept of of is used to define who their superior is. And so Judas of James is saying that Thaddeus is under James, and James here is James, son of Alphaeus. So why he's called Judas is just... Who knows? He's got other names, too. And again, a lot of the scholars just go into these big discussions about who all these people are, and they get totally confused. So this part is very simple. So now, here we are in the Gospel of John, and I've looked at all the passages and defined each person in a list on the right. So there's the passage on the left and the person on the right. John 1, 35, 36, 
right at the beginning, it's quite intriguing because who's the first disciple to show up? It's Andrew. And you have John 1, 40 to 46. Andrew is listening to John the Baptist. And when he sees Jesus, he decides to follow him. And he goes to get his brother Peter. So Andrew was the first to appear and then Peter. And when Jesus saw Peter, he, of course, there's this famous statement that he makes, Simon, son of Jonah, thou art to be called Cephas, which is interpreted a rock, or Petrus. So that's how he got the name Peter, although his name was really Simon. So the day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and finds Philip. So there's Philip. And then Philip finds Nathaniel, and here's a name we don't know. So then if we go on further to John 3, 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, ruler of the Jews. And this Nicodemus seems to be a very curious person. He's always asking Jesus questions. He does this in John 3, 4 to 9. He says, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born? Nicodemus said to him, how can this be? Of course, this is Jesus saying that everyone needs to be born again. Now, Philip appears again in John 6, 5 to 7. Jesus said to Philip, how are we to buy bread that these people may eat? And this, of course, is feeding the multitudes. And then in John 6, 8, one of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, appears. John 6, 68, Simon Peter appears asking a question, Lord, to whom shall we go? And in John 6, 70, 71, Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is the devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son. One of the twelve was to betray him. So this is Judas, son of Simon, going out on a limb here and saying, we're going to take this Simon person, and see if he has a value. So we're saving him on the right here, even though it could just be they're talking about Judas's father, but I'm using the concept that son of, which we've seen before, means that the superior of Judas is Simon, and that would make him more than just a father. So in John 7, 50, 51, Nicodemus is asking another question. And he came to Jesus by night, being one of them. Does our Lord judge any man before it hear him and know what he does? The important thing here, of course, is that it's saying Nicodemus is one of them. That certainly means that Nicodemus must be a disciple. Now, in John 11, 1, we have, Now a certain man was ill. Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. Now everyone knows Mary and Martha, because those are very prominent females in the gospel. But this person, Lazarus, is a very strange name. It doesn't seem like it should belong to anybody. What would the name Lazarus mean? We will have to figure that one out. And he appears a lot. He's in all of John 11 here. Now in John 11, 11, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to wake him out of sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. So here's Thomas in John 11, 16. He kind of seems a lot like a fool because he's saying to his fellow disciples, let us go that we may die with him, which is a really strange comment. It would seem that Thomas knows that this Lazarus person is very important and he wants to die with the same death as Lazarus. So now in John eleven seventeen, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. And then in John 11:43, when he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus came out. And then in John 12:1, six days before the Passover, 
And the Passover, of course, is an important date because that's going to be when the crucifixion happens. And Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. This is amazing. This is a person that supposedly was dead, and now he's sitting at the table as if it's just matter of fact. And at this table also is Judas Iscariot. That's John 12, 4, 5. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, he was the one to betray him and said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Of course, this is referring to the lady who nobody wants to admit is Mary Magdalene, his future wife, who is going through the marriage ceremony. But that is another point that we can't get into. Then in John 12, 9, 10, when a great crowd of Jews are learned that he was there, they came, not only on account of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests planned to put Lazarus also to death. And that's crazy. <laughs> Lazarus was just raised from the dead, and now they're going to put him to death. Do you think that will really work out when the people are just amazed at this miracle? So they came to Philip who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, We wish to see Jesus. And Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew went with Philip, and they told Jesus. So now we're at the Last Supper in John 13, 2. And during the supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So again, we have Simon's son. So I'm including Simon as a person here. So in John 13, 6, 9, this is the washing of the feet, and Simon Peter is complaining that Jesus is not going to wash his feet. But of course, Jesus says he will do it because he's not special. So John 13, 23, and then in the Last Supper, we have another person who appears who is unnamed. And it says, Now there was leaning on Jesus' breast one of the disciples whom Jesus loved. And then in the Last Supper we have Peter. And in John 13, 26, So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. And then Judas went out. So Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and we shall be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I not been with you so long, and yet you do not know me? So now we have in John 14, 22, just to confuse us, there's a Judas, not Iscariot. Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? It does sound like the questioning Nicodemus, doesn't it? Okay, so now in John 18, 2 to 5. This is after the Last Supper, and they're in the Garden of Gethsemane, and Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place. So Judas, procuring the band of soldiers, Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. So that's, of course, Judas Iscariot. And then Peter in John 18, 10, 11 tries to take a sword, and he cuts off the right ear of this slave whose name is Malchus. So there's Peter, and of course Malchus cannot possibly be a disciple. So John 18, 15 to 18, Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. As this disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the court of the high priest along with Jesus. And then Peter was also with them standing, warming himself by the fire. So that's Peter again. Then in John 18, 25 to 27, we have Simon Peter denying Jesus while the cock crows. That's another famous story. And then in John 18, 40, 
Jesus is up for trial in front of Pilate, and they're saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. So here's the person, Barabbas. And then John 19, 18. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. So I've listed two others here because maybe they are disciples. Who knows? So John 19, 26, Jesus is talking from the cross. And when he saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And here's the disciple whom Jesus loved appearing again. And then after he was taken down from the cross, in John 19.38, Joseph of Arimathea turns up. He's called a disciple of Jesus. But secretly, he's a disciple for fear of the Jews. And he asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. So then also, in the next verse, John 19.39, Nicodemus turns up. He's the one who came to Jesus at night. And he was bearing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, as it were, a hundred pounds. I just kind of picture him showing up with a big wheelbarrow. And it's just a strange scene. But of course, that's to say that he was the one who was able to bring Jesus back to life in the cave. So now Mary Magdalene goes to the cave. And she thinks that Jesus is missing from the cave. So in John 22, and she goes to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said, they took away the Lord out of the tomb and we have not known where they laid him. So here's Simon Peter and the disciple that Jesus loved. And then in John 20, 24 to 28, we have Thomas, one of the 12 called the twin, he wasn't with Jesus when Jesus came, because this is after the resurrection. And he said, well, I won't believe that Jesus was resurrected until I touch him. And after he did, he said, my Lord and my God. Of course, that's why he's called the Doubting Thomas. So now we get to John 21, and it's believed to have been added. But yes, it has been added. But in its revision under Matthew in 48 AD, when it was first published, and it was one of the last Gospels published. First there was Matthew, and then Mark, and then Luke, and then John. So these are important. John 21, 2. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. There were together Simon Peter, and Thomas, who is called the twin, Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and we can figure out that they are James and John, and two others of his disciples, which they don't say, but they might be Philip or Andrew. And then in John 21, 7, we again have the disciple whom Jesus loved saying to Peter, this is the Lord because they didn't know at first that Jesus was standing right there at the Sea of Tiberias. So now we've gone through the whole gospel, and we've got the names that are unique to John in order of appearance. We have Nathaniel, and we're going to assign him to James, son of Alphaeus, for reasons that we will discuss. And we have Nicodemus, whom we're going to assign to Thaddeus, and I said that these names are unique to John, but it's quite intriguing that Lazarus, in Luke 16, 20 to 25, with this parable about a rich man who's in hell, and he's burning up in hell, and he's saying to Abraham, please tell my sons how terrible it is and tell them to be good, because the beggar Lazarus is up with Abraham, and he's not in hell. So... This is quite an intriguing parable because it's also a pun because you have to put it together, the people here. The rich man is the high priest Ananus, who was the father of five high priests. 
we, we will talk about later. And two of these priests saw Matthew and James, son of Alphaeus. Alphaeus being Ananus. Then the beggar is up with Abraham, and his name is Lazarus. And so the completion of this pun is to say that Lazarus is Simon, and that would be Simon Magus. And he was raised from the dead by Jesus. But of course, being raised from the dead is a metaphor for the concept of being excommunicated, because that's like being dead. So there we're seeing some of the pieces of the pressure of Christ, although I've tried to keep it simple, because there'd be no other way to figure out who Lazarus was. You could go through all sorts of etymology and things like that, but you'll never come up with who he is. So then we are missing a person who's very prominent in the lists of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts, and called Bartholomew. And it makes sense to make this person be the disciple whom Jesus loved because he certainly is an important person to Jesus. And then going back to that Judas, not Iscariot, the explanation for this is that Thaddeus has moved into Judas Iscariot's seat after Judas left. So he's in the position of Judas, but he's not Judas Iscariot. Just things to confuse everybody. The confusion is not to make it difficult for anyone to figure it out. It's to be made difficult so that the Romans and the corrupt leaders of the different countries won't suddenly arrest all these people. So it's better to, to hide their identities as much as possible. So then we're looking at the names contained in the four Gospels that aren't assigned. And the obvious one is the two others we said who were crucified with Jesus, and I'll show you how they show up. In Mark 15, 21, and they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. This wonderful person just out of the blue comes along and says, oh, Jesus, this cross is too heavy for you. I'm going to carry it for you, which is a fun story. This is a way of telling you that Simon, Simon Magus, is there with Jesus carrying his own cross to the crucifixion. And the way you can figure this out is that Alexander would be Thaddeus, who came from Egypt. He was a therapeut from Egypt, in addition to being a zealot leader. And Rufus... That has to do with Thomas, the twin. He was called the twin because he was similar to Esau and Jacob, where Jacob stole the inheritance from Esau. And Esau had red hair. And Thomas was supposed to be a Herod king, and it was taken away from him by Herod the Great because his mother was accused of intrigue against him. So now, of course, the other interesting story that's in all the Gospels is about how Judas Iscariot had pieces of silver that he was given and that he went and hanged himself. And that's an important line, too, because that is defining who is the second person on the cross, and that is Judas Iscariot. He hanged himself. His pieces of silver didn't save him from the cross by betraying Jesus. So the two others have been defined with us. One is Simon Magus, and one is Judas Iscariot on the cross with Jesus. So now the other person is this Joseph of Arimathea. But if you look in Luke 23, 50 to 52, he's a member of the council, a good and righteous man. And this is again indicating that it's Jesus' brother, James the Just, and he's not a disciple. And Joseph of Arimathea is obviously disguised because he's asking Pilate for Jesus' body. And I don't think that Pilate would give it to one of the disciples, but he would give it to the brother 
of Jesus. That would be only fair for him to do. So now I've made a list where it's showing the substitutions in John, with the first column being the number from Matthew, and the number in parentheses is the order of appearance within the Gospels. And so just going across the top, we have Peter, then we have Andrew, and then we have James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and then we have Philip, and we have Bartholomew, who we've now have defined as the disciple that Jesus loved, and then Thomas, and then we have Matthew, who is actually called a tax collector, and he's not present in John. Then James, son of Alphaeus. He's consistent across Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts, but he must be the person called Nathaniel, and we'll go into the reasons why that is a match. And then we have Thaddeus with his name Lebius, whose surname was Thaddeus. We have Judas of James, who's the same person as Thaddeus. And then we have Nicodemus, who's the same person as Thaddeus. And then we have Simon the Canaanite in Matthew and Mark. He's the zealot in Luke, and he's the Canaanite in Acts. He'll be Simon, who's the superior of Judas. Remember, we saved his name off from that. And he's also Lazarus. And then, of course, the last one here is Judas Iscariot. So now we've kind of done this logically without invoking the Pesher of Christ, but I couldn't help it because it's just so amazing that the Pesher of Christ reveals everything that people have wondered about and connects all the dots. And so I'm going to do a brief discussion of the disciples here. So we have Andrew and Peter in the picture from the Last Supper. Peter's name was Simon, having been changed by Jesus to Peter, Petros, meaning rock so as not to be confused with Simon Magus. Paul sometimes called him Cephas, which means rock in Aramaic, and he actually appears in the historian Josephus, Antiquities of the Jews, Book 8, Chapter 6, Point 3, as Protus. And Protus is a freedman of Bernice, Agrippa's mother, being correctly interpreted by the translator Winston as Peter. Now, Peter, many people don't realize, was married because in Mark 1, 29, 30, Matthew 8, 14, 15, Luke 4, 38, Jesus healed Peter's wife's mother. So there are indications that his mother-in-law was Galafria, daughter of the Cappadocian king Oculus was related to the Herodian dynasty by Herod's sons. Her first marriage was to Alexander, who was one of the sons of Herod, who was killed by Herod. And the third was as married to Archelaus. And this indicates Peter, with his wife, had strong Herodian connections. And it is significant that after being healed, Peter's wife's mother ministered to James and John, which indicated that she was their mother superior in the Herodian church. And Andrew, with a non-Jewish name, was unclean. And Peter, though Jewish, named Simon, was married. He would also be unclean, thus being on the lower Essene level of females and not eligible to participate with the celibate members until the water into wine miracle made them equal. So you see, they are actually placed under a mother like the females in the order would be. Both Peter and Andrew would be in that position. And they usually appear together, and so, of course, the scholars believe that they are brothers and fishermen, but they were only brothers in a monastery. And Andrew himself was probably a Cappadocian freedman. And now the term fisherman is also not the literal interpretation but they were involved in the reenactment of the Noah's Ark story, having the job of fishing new Gentile converts from the sea. This was baptism in salt water, which was the first step to becoming an initiate, and in the beginning, the only way for Gentiles. The logic was that Noah could save non-Jews, as he was the father of all races. 
Later, through the efforts of Jesus, Gentiles would be allowed baptism in fresh water and would qualify for being present in the holy table to drink wine. And this was the metaphor of turning water into wine. Now, Andrew was the first to leave John the Baptist for Jesus. And since there's no mention of his exploits in Acts, it is quite possible that he followed his own path, as shown in the Acts of Andrew. So now we have James and John, and they almost always occur together, and this is because they were twins. Strangely, the Gospel of John does not mention either of them by name. They are called sons of Zebedee. And Zebedee turns out to be Simon Magus by reference to the Clementines. So that would be in the Clementine Recognitions and Homilies, which are both differently derived works shunned by the church. And in it, their full names are James Nicetta and John Aquila, who were illegitimate children related to the emperors of Rome, probably the result of the affair between Augustus Caesar's daughter, Julia the Elder, and the son of Mark Anthony, Julius Antonius. Tiberius had Julius Antonius murdered and Julia the Elder was banished to an island. And they were adopted by Helena, the mother of Mary Magdalene. It was Helena that was being stoned when Jesus intervened, as she was originally a temple virgin until found with child. Helena was rescued by Simon Magus and considered to be his consort, though both were celibate. She had the position of Martha. Thus he was their stepfather, Zebedee. John Aquila's name is revealed in Acts 18.2.3. So there definitely is a connection to the Clementines. And in that, it says Paul found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul came to them because he was, he was of the same trade. He stayed with them and they worked together, for they were tent makers by trade. Tent maker means forming churches. And now again, it's interesting that John Aquila was married to Priscilla. And they ended up being chaperones at Paul's marriage to Jesus' daughter, Tamar Phoebe. And James and John's younger brother was Clement, who turned out to be the first pope after Peter. So as I said, the scholars and the church love to throw out these Clementine connections, but once you put them all together, they are a perfect match. So now we have the disciple of Jesus, Philip, known to be the author of the Gospel of Philip, which implied that Mary Magdalene and Jesus were married. He is also mentioned as having four unmarried daughters who prophesied. That's in Acts 21, 8 to 9. One of these was Mary Magdalene, having left Jesus in the schism of the churches, along with John Mark, the disciple that Jesus loved, who returned later after her death in 58 AD. She, of course, knew the true story that Papias told Eusebius in Fragments of Papias, Church History 39, 8 to 10, that says that Jesus did not die on the cross. And here it is quoted, it is worthwhile, however, to add the words of Papias given above other passages from him, which he records from some other wonderful events likewise by tradition, that Philip the Apostle resided in Hierapolis with his daughters, has already been stated, but how Papias, their contemporary, relates that he had heard a marvelous tale from the daughters of Philip, for he relates that in his time a man rose from the dead, and again, he gives another wonderful story about Justus, who was surnamed Barsabas, how he was put forward with Matthias, and how they prayed for the right choice in place of the traitor Judas. That should make their number complete. Now, here's the story that we have of the Justus, who was surnamed Barsabas. And we talked about how Barsabas is son of Sabas and was used as a last name by his other brothers. And you would have to see from this that Sabbath is Joseph, their father. 
There's a Jesus justice in Acts. And the word justice means basically the leader or the anointed one. That also relates to Joseph's brother being called James the Just. So it's sort of like a king title here. And so this justice, Bosibus, has to be Jesus. And it says how he rose from the dead, because he drank a deadly poison, and yet by the grace of God suffered no inconvenience. So there is the answer to how Jesus survived the cross and in the cave was revived. So now we have John Mark, who's also Bartholomew. He's called the disciple that Jesus loved. And the reason for this is that he stood for Mary Magdalene, his wife, had male-only affairs. And he also wrote the Gospel of John with Jesus. Now, the derivation of Bartholomew, there's the bar in front of the name, makes him son of Tholomew, which is clearly son of Ptolemy, which places him from Alexandria, Egypt. And then in Acts, he can be associated with Eutychus as a centurion's servant, similar to the nobleman's son in John, the healing from a distance. He was a freedman of Herod Agrippa and was probably originally from Egypt. And it's interesting in the works of Philo Judaeus on the contemplative life, section three. Philo talks about the therapeutes from Alexandria who practiced the art of healing. And then it's quite intriguing, of course, when Jesus was on the cross, he gave the task of the disciple who he loved. He said, look after Mary Magdalene, the mother of his child in the womb. And John Mark did faithfully stay with Mother Mary in Ephesus. Now, Bartholomew's real name appears in Acts 12.12. 12. It's called John, who was surnamed Mark. And then his further identity as Eutychus in the story in Acts 27 to 12. He fell down listening to a talk from Paul. And this was symbolic for his return to the faith. Paul healed him. And also there is a Eutychus who is the charioteer of Agrippa. And he informed on Agrippa by overhearing a talk between Nero against Claudius. And this put Herod Agrippa into prison. And what's intriguing is that Eutychus also accused Agrippa of having a robe that belonged to him. And this is probably the robe that was put on Jesus at the crucifixion. In Acts, he is John Mark, and he accompanies Barnabas and Paul on their first missionary journey. But when Mary Magdalene is divorced from Jesus, John Mark, as her guardian, left with her but returned after her death. So there's obviously confusion in the church history about the two Johns. The John on Patmos who wrote the first part of Revelation, and he's the brother of James. The later John in Revelations is the son of John Aquila and Priscilla. So now we have Thomas, who is the heir of Herod, but his birthright was taken away. And of course, he's well known as being the doubting Thomas and having the Gospel of Thomas, which is as important as the Gospel of Philip, being the two Gnostic Gospels. And he also is in the Acts of Thomas. His identity is very intriguing in the Gospel of John. He is called Didymus, meaning the twin. And this is a biblical reference to Esau and Jacob, where Jacob stole Esau's inheritance. Herod the Great had promised the kinship to Thomas, but when his mother was implicated in a plot to kill Herod, he was dispossessed. And this is shown in Josephus Antiquities, 1477-78, Josephus Wars, 1-600. He is referred by Josephus as Herod. Another Herod called Antipas persuaded Herod Thomas's wife Herodias to marry him which meant that Antipas divorced his wife, which started a small war. That's in Josephus Antiquities 18, 109 to 115. But more importantly for Christianity, it led to the death of John the Baptist, 
who opposed the marriage. That's Mark 6, 14 to 29. Salome, who danced for Herod, especially Thomas's daughter. Note that Herodias is incorrectly called another Herod Philip's wife. He was important to Jesus because he actually did not mind about losing his wife because he was homosexual and therefore was still on good terms with Antipas Herod, who was the ruler of Galilee. So now we get to Jonathan and Matthew. Now, since James, son of Alphaeus, does not appear in the Gospel of John, and neither does Bartholomew, in fact, neither do James and John by name, scholars are confused, not whether to assign him with James, brother of John, or James and the brother of Jesus. Actually, it is neither. The clue in deciphering who he is is that he is reporting to an Alphaeus person. By the first part, being the Greek letter Alpha must refer to the top guy. In fact, Alphaeus is standing for Annas the high priest. And here is his picture. And actually, Jesus is brought before him in the trial, John 18, 13 to 24. He is also the father of five high priests and a daughter married to Caiaphas, the high priest who sent Jesus to be crucified. Here are the five priests listed. And it's interesting if you compare Nathaniel, this last line of 21, 2, about going fishing after Jesus' death. There's almost word for word line in the Gospel of Peter, verse 30. And it talks about Levi, son of Alphaeus. And it says, but we, the twelve disciples of the Lord, mourned and were grieved, and each one being grieved, that which had come to pass, departed to his home. But I, Simon Peter, and Andrew, my brother, took our nets and went to the sea, and there was with us Levi, the son of Alphaeus. Now here they're using the word Levi, and of course the Levites were the priests. But there is an even more important connection, and that is that the name Nathaniel means God has given, which is similar to Jonathan, gift of God. Jonathan was the son of Saul, king of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. Some scholars say that Jonathan was a homosexual and had a crush on David. Given that Jonathan was the prince, son of King Saul, and David took his title by marrying his sister, this tells us quite a bit about the relationship of James, son of Alphaeus, to Jesus, who was in the lineage of David. It would also explain why he was later called Stephanus, meaning crown, making him the same Stephen who was martyred. In the list of the disciples, Matthew is said to be the tax collector, and since he wrote that gospel, it is clear that he was in on the joke. Actually, the Sadducee priests collected taxes, which were collected as church tithes, and that's in Hebrews 7, 5. And these descendants of Levi, who received the priestly office, have a commandment in the law to take tithes from people, that is, from their brothers, though these also are descended from Abraham. This, again, is an example of the obvious explanation of tax collector, overlooked by experts, that makes Matthew, Levi, not a forgiven, hated tax collector of the Romans, but a tax collector of the church, and in fact a priest of the priestly line of Levi. And Levi in Mark 2.15 and Luke 5.27 is Jonathan Annas, as Levi's son of Alphaeus, a tax collector and a publican who was called to follow Jesus. And the reference lists of Levi's son of Alphaeus and Matthew the tax collector from the Gospels, Mark 2, 14. As he passed by, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting in the receipt of custom and said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And then in Luke 5, 27, after these things, he went forth and he saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, Follow me. And Luke 5, 29, and Levi made him a great feast in his own house, and there was a great company of publicans and others that sat down with them. And Matthew 9, 9, And as Jesus passed from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of the custom, and said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. So there you go. They're both Levites 
and not hated tax collectors. So now we have Thaddeus, Barabbas, Nicodemus, who was a healer and a zealot. So his real name is Thutis, and he was the military leader of the Therapeutes, who fought with Judas the Galilean in the Zealot Revolt of 6 AD. This was the reason for his many names as a wanted criminal. His name, Zadok, the Pharisee, is shown in Josephus Antiquities 18 I 1. The name Zadok is associated with the first high priest in Solomon's temple, indicating that he was a Zealot priest. He was also called Thaddeus or Lebius, whose surname was Thaddeus. By comparison to the disciple list, Judas, son of James, was equated to Thaddeus. And it makes sense that his superior would be Jonathan Annas, Nathaniel, the son of the high priest Annas. As Nicodemus meaning victory for the people, he questioned Jesus and used his healing arts as a therapeut to purge the poison that was given to Jesus on the cross. The purpose of the poison was to make Jesus appear to be dead so that he could be taken down from the cross. Under the name of Brabus, son of the abbot, the war hero was considered too old to be put up on the cross, so Jesus was substituted. Note that Simon Bar Copa, the zealot, had a similar bar in his name. In Josephus Antiquities 20, 97, 98, he met his end at a symbolic crossing of the River of Jordan. So now we have Simon the Zealot, Canaanite, Simon Magus the Magician, he's Lazarus, but his real identity is revealed in Acts 8, 9. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the nation of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. From this he is called Simon Magus. Once the disguises are removed, he has many references, not only from the Clementines, the Acts of Peter, Eusebius of Chronicle, but also as follows, he's Zebedee, because Helen or his consort had adopted James and John, and then Simon of Cyrene, carrying the cross for Jesus. He's Lazarus. He's Simon the leper in Matthew 26, 6 and Mark 14, 3. He's Simon the tanner in Acts 9, 43 and Acts 10, 6. He's Ananias in Acts 5, 1 through 5, Acts 9, 10 to 17, Josephus, Antiquities 20, 2, 3. He's the great power of God in Acts 8, 10. He's in the Acts of Peter. He's in Eusebius, Ecclesiastical History 2, 1, 11. He's Demetrius, the silversmith. In Acts 19.24, this is a story that includes Paul. And he's the beast 666 in Revelations 13.18. And the discussion of Simon Magus is too large to discuss here because he was the superior of Jesus. He's such an important person and he was hated by the church. That's why they call him beast 666. There is an engaging story in the Clementine books and the Acts of Peter that show that Simon is Peter's nemesis, with Peter chasing him from town to town and trying to outspeech him and outmagic him. Finally, in the Acts of Peter, Peter causes Simon to fall during one of his flying magic acts on a high wire. This is commemorated by a plaque in the Francisco Romano Church near the Colosseum in Rome, which shows the knee prints of Peter when he prayed to make Simon Magus fall. He was badly injured and died. It also seems more than a coincidence that the Gnostic work, the second treatise of the great Seth, claims that Simon was on the cross instead of Jesus and that Jesus survived. Yes, they saw me, they punished me. It was another, their father, who drank the gall and vinegar. It was not I. They struck me with the reed. It was another, Simon, who bore the cross on his shoulder. It was another upon whom they placed the crown of thorns. But I was rejoicing in the height over the wealth 
of the Archon and the offspring of their error, of their empty glory. And I was laughing at their ignorance. Now we're finally at Judas, and everyone knows all about him. But the interesting story is that he was on the cross with Jesus. And he was brought back to the tomb with Simon Magus and Jesus. And of course, being a traitor, they didn't really help him in the cave and eventually threw him over from the cave. And these caves are there in Qumran. And you could see it was a huge fall that they threw him out. And he would have smashed to pieces, as they talk about. And of course, this Iscariot part of his name came from the Zealots, who used a curved dagger in their cloaks to assassinate people by hiding in crowds. So there it is. We've given a brief discussion of the disciples at the end here. What I thought was most important is to show you that a pressure of Christ involves a lot of logic putting all the pieces together. And you have to also have an open mind. You can't come with it the way the scholars do with preconceived concepts of who everybody is. And also the church's concept that Jesus couldn't have possibly married Mary Magdalene. Because once you are open to the fact, you'll find that all these different factors fit together. And that's why I started this talk trying to show you how one can use logic and come up with answers. And that was true for the Gospel of John, where suddenly you found answers to who the disciples are, even though they weren't specified by name, and then follow through all these connections and you find an amazing story. So I hope to have other talks about the pressure of Christ, but this is the first one. And I hope you have listened to it all. And I'll try to do some more.